Guten Abend. I'm going to talk in English, but uh, as Bob explained, uh, the slides will be in Dutch. And I trust that you will get the information of this evening because it is so important that it is impossible not to be part of this message. What I will be talking about tonight is a time span of about three decades. And I start with today, or that is September this year. Title of the Dutch newspaper was Vitamine C Relevance of Intensive Care. Two thousand seventeen. This year also this professor Helen Odemans van Straten from the Freie Universität was describing vitamin C as an important factor in the battle for human life at one of the leading universities in the Netherlands. The Journal of the Dutch Cardiologists, the Cardiolog, in October 2017, this year, now in heart still stands, now in infuse vitamin C. How come? How come that all of a sudden these leading mainstream institutions of medicine are not just interested in vitamin C, but promoting it publicly as a modern, superior approach to health problems that conventional medicine could not or could not adequately solve. Let's go back. We will tonight look at diseases that until today are making millions of people sick in Utrecht, in the Netherlands, in Europe, in the world. Arteriosclerosis, diabetes, arrhythmia, heart failure. But we have to address the question, why did it take so long? Why are still today people dying from these diseases? And above all, what we can do to accelerate this change and to save lives. Heart disease is the largest epidemic in the world at this point. Roughly one-third of the people dying on our planet are dying from this one condition. The hardening of the arteries and its consequences, heart attacks and strokes. Worldwide, the number of deaths from this disease is 17.7 .7 million at this time which is roughly the population of the Netherlands. So each year in the world, the number of people 
die from heart disease that equal the number of people living in your country. Not to speak about the costs of this disease. And here are the projections. The World Economic Forum is an international organization that works closely with the United Nations. In 2011, they had a special session at the United Nations in New York, and they published these figures. Heart attacks and strokes will further increase worldwide. What does that tell us? Well, there is a law in medicine that says if a disease continues in epidemic proportions, like heart disease, then the true cause, the root cause of disease has not been discovered. For the very simple reason, if it were discovered, there would be possibilities to prevent it and eventually to eliminate this disease. So the fact that international institutions are predicting that this epidemic will actually expand is a bankruptcy declaration of conventional medicine in front of this disease. And it is not surprising. There are questions, unsolved questions in medicine, in cardiology today that you will understand need an urgent answer. For example, why do we get heart attacks and not nose attacks or ear attacks or elbow attacks? If cholesterol, high cholesterol levels, would be the cause of atherosclerosis, the cholesterol levels in the body are the same in every organ because it's one pipeline. Why do we get arteriosclerosis but not venosclerosis? Or you have you heard about the clogging of veins from the hardening of veins? And finally, Why are heart attacks and strokes in animals not an epidemic? They can occur, especially when animals are a bit older, but they are the exception. As opposed to humans, where every second man and woman in the Netherlands and in Europe die from this condition. The answers that I'm going to be giving you tonight, they started 25 years ago to come into my life. I was a doctor in Germany, in the German Heart Center in Berlin, a factory of modern medicine. But the solutions to this problem that they offered were mechanical in nature. You have coronary artery disease, you have deposits in the arteries of your heart that cause you angina pectoris. No problem. We have an answer. We create 
a bypass around the problem. Mechanical answers. You have just one deposit in your arteries, no problem. We take a balloon and we remove this deposit mechanically. Were the doctors, my colleagues there, interested in understanding how these deposits came about? Not really. I was. And this brought me into research. And the research brought me to work with Linus Pauling, who had been known at that time as probably the world's most famous researcher in vitamin research. Together we published some landmark papers. As you can see from the title, Solution to the Puzzle of Human Cardiovascular Disease. A pretty bold title. It was not my idea to call this paper Solution to the Puzzle of Human Cardiovascular Disease. It was the recommendation of Linus Pauling. He said, your discoveries are so important that they can one day eliminate this disease largely. Maybe not completely, but largely. They can stop that this disease continues in epidemic proportions. So this title was not a bragging a bag of hot air. It was the conclusion of the discoveries we had made. This is the cross-section of an artery. The dark red circle is the original wall of this artery. Everything inside that is lightly red and pinkish does not belong there originally. That is an atherosclerotic plaque, a deposit. These plaques, they develop over many years, over decades. The final event when a blood thrombus, a blood clotting occurs inside is a matter of seconds. But the development of this deposit here is a matter of decades. If we talk about prevention tonight, we need to talk about preventing this process. Because everything that happens in those seconds, that belongs into the intensive care of a hospital. We have to start understanding this disease before these plaques develop. Only then will we be able to reduce and eventually eliminate this disease. When we analyze these deposits, we find a multitude of elements. One of the more prominent elements of these plaques are fat molecules. Now you may have heard about cholesterol or triglycerides. These are fat molecules, but they do not swim in the bloodstream like fat in the soup. 
They are part of a particle connected with a protein. They form round particles. The center is the fat and this protein is the transport structure that gives these fat molecules a round shape. This is LDL, so-called schlechte cholesterol. But there is a very bad cholesterol, a super schlechte cholesterol, that is composed of an LDL globule plus a plug band, which is of course a protein, which is extremely adhesive, cleverig. And it is this plug band that attaches these articles inside the blood vessel wall. The studies I had conducted 30 years ago together with my colleagues at the University of Hamburg, they showed that as the deposit grows, the number, the amount of lipoproteins inside these deposits increases. So there's a clear connection between the size of these deposits or the danger for a heart attack and the amount of these particles inside our artery wall. But now comes the decisive question. <clears throat> Is the deposition of these fat molecules the cause of the deposits? Or is it already part of solving the problem? What I mean with that? This is a football field. If one would cut my body open, put all the arteries, veins, and capillaries of my body side by side, the surface area of my blood vessel system would be the surface area of this football field. So how come that in the 90% of the cases, not this entire field is affected with infarctions, but only a small portion of this pipeline system that is the size of the penalty spot. Once again, if cholesterol, high cholesterol, would be the cause, the primary cause of human cardiovascular disease, the entire football field would be affected at the same frequency. Another example. That's the view of the center of Maastricht. Maastricht is known as a city where the water quality has been bad for centuries. The consequences after the water pipelines were built was that the pipelines in Maastricht clogged frequently in every household because it was the water that was bad. It was not just one house that was affected. Again, translated it back to the human body, if the quality of our blood would be bad by high cholesterol levels, it is a law 
that we would get infarctions everywhere in our body at the same rate, not just in the heart, as it happens in the majority of the cases. In conclusion, human logic excludes that high cholesterol is the primary cause of cardiovascular disease. A schoolchild can understand that. So we have to answer the question, what then? What then causes heart disease? What is the primary event? What is the event where we have to attack first in preventing this epidemic? What is this? A garden. A garden with trees planted by Dutch people. Where is this garden? In South Africa, in Cape Town. Why? It is the company garden of the Dutch East Indian Company. They planted it in the 17th century because on their ship journeys to India and to Asia, their sailors developed scurvy. So when they arrived in Cape Town, the first thing they did is was to eat citrus fruit because these were the main plants here. to prevent scurvy. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with scurvy, is this a disease like uh, the flu, sneezing, stomach cramps? No. It is a deadly disease. People suffering from scurvy, untreated, they die from this. Scurvy is caused by extreme vitamin C deficiency. The human body, unlike the body of most animals on our planet, cannot produce vitamin C in our, di in our body. Most animals can do that, or most living beings on this planet can do this by converting sugar into vitamin C. We, Homo sapiens, cannot do that. When we are at home and eat vegetables from the garden every day, we get enough vitamins not to suffer from scurvy. If you are on a ship for weeks, for sometimes months, in the 17th century, you develop scurvy because the diet on board of these ships has little or no vitamins. So you don't produce vitamin C in your body and the food on your ship is also lacking this vitamin. What are the consequences? The most important role of vitamin C is that it stimulates the production of the most important stability molecules in our body, collagen. Collagen has a similar function in the human body like uh, the iron reinforcement steel in a skyscraper building, a high riser. Stability. This picture summarizes our understanding. On the left side, you have the situation like it occurs in most animals. They have high amounts of vitamin C being produced every day. 
between 10 and 20 grams compared to the human body weight every day. They have an optimum production of collagen molecules, reinforcement molecules. Their arteries are protected because there is a lot of stability there. And therefore, there are no deposits developing. This is the other extreme. Humans cannot produce vitamin C, and as we just heard, extreme lack of vitamin C in our diet, like it happened with the sailors, basically leads to a complete stop of the production of collagen. And that means that the body loses stability. And which organs are the first to be exposed to this problem? Well, you see it here. The arteries. Because of the blood pressure. The blood is being pumped through these arteries and they become leaky. So the blood leaves the blood vessels and scurvy patients die from blood loss, from hemorrhagic blood loss. Heart disease is right in the middle. We all get a little bit of vitamin C or vitamins in our diet, but not enough to create a situation like this. So over years and decades, little cracks and crevices, not the big losses like uh, big uh, holes like in a scurvy situation, but tiny little cracks and crevices develop. So slowly that the body has time to react and send Erste help molecules, first help molecules into the blood vessel wall in order to attempt to save this life from deadly blood loss. That was the contents of these publications that I showed you at the beginning that I wrote with Linus Pauling together. A complete new understanding. It is not the cholesterol in the bloodstream that causes millions of deaths. It is the instability of the blood vessel wall due to long-term vitamin deficiency. This video summarizes this. You have here the micronutrients, the vitamins in optimum amounts, and the blood vessel wall is intact. This is the endothelial lining, the cell lining between the bloodstream and the wall. Now, with vitamin deficiency, with less of those colored molecules coming, the endothelial cells, they open up with gaps. And now the repair molecules, you see them in yellow colors, they enter into the inside of the artery walls in order to mend, to repair this wall from further damage. And over time, over years and decades, this is what's happening. The deposits develop. And of course, now, with this new understanding, we can reverse this process by increasing the amounts of micronutrients, the repair molecules can leave the wall, the endothelial cells line up again, and we have a reversible situation. So far, the concept that we published. 
And obviously, it was important, like with any scientific concept, to prove this. Now, the next part of my talk will be about this proof. We conducted a clinical study with 55 patients with diagnosed coronary artery disease, diagnosed by ultra-fast CT, this machine here, that can measure calcium deposits in the coronary arteries. For one year, they received a micronutrient program. During this year, they did not have any bypass operation or balloon catheters or any procedures. Before the study, this was the growth of the deposits per year. It is measured in the calcium score, as the unit is called. Then they started with the micronutrients, vitamins and certain other micronutrients, natural molecules, with the idea to repair the damaged artery wall, naturally. And as you can see, during the first six months, there was still growth. Because the cells, the genetic core that determines the metabolism of each of these cells, was in a mode of repair. It is only after six months that this genetic program in the cells was turned around and they stopped growing. In some cases, it was not just a stop of the growth. This is one of the patients, and this is, by the way, the method it was measured, a CT scan you look from the bottom into the heart, so this is the left coronary artery. This is this white spot, a deposit. After one year, the same patient, the same heart, the same left coronary artery, the same spot, and it is no longer detectable. No surgical removal. Natural reversal of coronary artery disease. Documented for the first time, not with a beta blocker or a calcium antagonist, but with natural molecules. For those of you who want to read the entire study, you can do so. You can go to our website and uh, look it up. We were not the only ones in the last 20 years that confirmed this. Huge studies followed. I can only quote a few of them because of the number of patients they included. The analysis of nine studies with a total of almost 300,000 participants evaluated over 10 years showed that vitamin C of over 700 milligrams per day decreased the risk of heart and uh, blood vessel disease by one-fourth, by 25 percent. Eighteen clinical studies with 250,000 participants almost studied the question of strokes and the risk could be reduced by up to 38 percent based on the vitamin C levels. All that is fascinating. But in order to prove 
this revolutionary concept that vitamin deficiency is the primary cause of human cardiovascular disease, of the death of millions of people worldwide, can come only from one experiment, and that is, does a low level of vitamin C in the diet, without changing fat content, carbohydrate content, protein contents, or anything else, just one factor, decreasing the amount of vitamin C in the diet, cause atherosclerosis. It is obvious that this question could not be studied in humans. It would be unethical to say, well, sorry, but you are not getting enough vitamin C and we want to see whether you develop a heart attack. That nowhere in the world can this be done, and rightly so. So how did we overcome this problem? Our research team developed a fascinating, unique animal model, unique in the entire world. This animal model cannot produce vitamin C, just like humans. But it produces this super sticky lipoprotein that we just got to know. Two factors that are unique to human cardiovascular disease. So we did the following experiment. We created two groups of these animals. We put one group on high levels of vitamin C in the diet and the second group just got a little bit of vitamin C so as to avoid open scurvy. Remember, both groups did not produce vitamin C in their bodies. One group received high amounts of vitamin C in the diet, the other one low amounts of vitamin C. Just like testing the human system, where we say most people, in the Western world at least, get too little vitamins in the diet. That's exactly what we wanted to mimic. And here are the results. This is a cross-section of an artery under the microscope. You see here the normal shape of the artery wall and this structure here you know already that's a plaque that is a plaque and that is a plaque and as you can see there is a disruption these dark structures here these are collagen molecules and they break open here and this is where these deposits develop. In the second group that received optimum amounts of vitamin C in their diet, you see a clean artery wall, no deposits. The structure of the connective tissue, the collagens, elastins and other stability molecules are intact. Once again, the difference here is not cholesterol feeding. The difference is low vitamin C in the diet. It doesn't stop there. The deposits in this animal model 
We are developing at sites of high mechanical stress. Just like in the human system, the coronary arteries. That is a coronary artery. It was not a generalized atherosclerosis. And I've shown this already, the structure of the connective tissue is disrupted at the sites where these plaques develop. And the next question, the last question that was of interest is, in the animals that receive low levels of vitamin C, do we see an entry of these repair molecules into the blood vessel wall? And do we see that also in the animals that are having high levels of vitamin C? And here is the result. We marked those fat molecules with a brown colored marker. So everywhere you see this brown color, you find those super clevrige lipoprotein fat molecules. You do not find them in the animals that received enough vitamin C where the blood vessel was, was intact. Again, we published these fantastic results. And it's a landmark publication. It's online, available for everyone to read. The title reads, Hypoascorbemia, which is the technical term for low level of vitamin C, induces atherosclerosis and vascular deposition of lipoprotein A. This is this super sticky molecule in transgenic mice. This is this mouse model that we developed. Now back to the human system. We studied the question, can we induce the collagen molecules going back? Can we induce the production of these stability molecules in human cells of the artery wall? And we can. We tested two micronutrient compositions. This one is the control value, zero value. No additions of micronutrients and the amount of collagen produced by these cells was measured and put as zero. Then we added the micronutrient compositions that we had developed and one of them increased the production of collagen molecules by 200 percent, the other one by 150 plus percent. So we are able to influence the stability in the human body in a natural way. Of course, None of these studies I could show you without this team here. These are the researchers at our research institute in the US, head of the institute. The director is Dr. Nitzvicki, who has been working with us for now 30 years. If you want to visit the website of the institute, you can do so online at this address. What are the consequences of this new understanding? Well, very simple. There's a problem in the body that says you're going to die if you don't act. Signals are being sent, cell signals, to the liver, which is the central metabolic organ in our body, help. Send me repair molecules. What does the liver do? It upregulates, it increases the production of cholesterol, of clotting factors, of these transport vehicles that you've just seen. And with the bloodstream 
they are being sent to the site of the problem. If the repair continues for too long, the help turns into a problem. So an initially life-saving mechanism becomes, if it goes on for too long, a problem. When the doctor takes your blood and measures your cholesterol levels, he does not start here with the problem, he measures it here, which means he doesn't have a complete understanding, he just measures there's too much cholesterol. Because at the university, the medical students and young doctors, they do not learn that this is the original problem. They are being taught that this one and this one are the problem. You see, what we need to do is we need to expand our vision on this problem from a, from a two-dimensional view to a complex, to a three-dimensional view. Sometimes medicine today reminds me on medieval times. There was the plague killing hundreds of thousands of people in medieval Europe, an infection. At the time, the people were told it's the punishment of the heavens for your sins. No one knew about microorganisms causing that problem. Arteriosclerosis today is the same. No one in medicine at this point can explain you why one person gets arteriosclerosis and the other doesn't. Bad luck. You are unfortunate. We don't know why, we just know you have this problem. So it's a strike of fate or of the heavens or the whatever. And that has to change. We have to leave that level of fatalistic medicine, that events just happen. We need to go to the root cause and understand why it happens. So arteriosclerotic plaque is initially a life-saving reparation, a life-saving repair process from the, of the artery wall when it's damaged by long-term vitamin deficiency. It becomes a life-threatening problem when it goes too long, goes on for too long. And our understanding of the entire disease process now also needs to be revised. This is the old one. The deposition of the fat molecules in the artery wall has no biological aim. It just happens. It is a fatalistic process. And it is not reversible, therefore, we make a bypass. Our new understanding is completely different. We understand why these molecules enter the artery wall, because there is a prior problem, the weakness of the artery wall. An atherosclerosis is a regulating process, a regulating repair process. And because of this new definition, something really fascinating happens that by law, by the definition of this new understanding, this process is principally reversible. I'm not saying that we can reverse all forms of atherosclerotic plaques. Of course, if this process has been going on for too long and it is too far, we will not be able to completely reverse it. But 
what, it, what is at stake now is that we need to increase the understanding that by understanding this new field, we can prevent this disease in this generation and in future generations. And we can help millions of people now who have early forms of this problem. And now you remember those open questions from the beginning that are unsolved. If you go to a cardiologist here in Utrecht, go to the University of Utrecht and ask the head of cardiology, ask the question, sir, why do we get heart attacks or nose attacks? He will or she will look at you and have no answer. You can test it with your general physician. They have no answer. We have the answer. We get heart attacks, we get infarctions in the heart because the heart is the only organ in the body that constantly what? Moves. The mechanical stress from a moving heart is illustrated here. This is the left coronary artery. In this picture it is magnified to have a look inside. With every heartbeat this takes place. This is the filling phase, the diastole. The heart is relaxed and the blood can flow through the coronary artery that rides on top of the heart. When the heart contracts 80 times per minute, the coronary artery on top of the heart is squeezed flat because the heart is compressed. To illustrate that, imagine you are stepping on a garden hose, the watering hose for your garden, a hundred thousand times a day. And you ask yourself, what happens? If this is a new garden hose, if it's elastic, nothing happens. You can do it 200,000 times. If it's weakened, structurally weakened, right under your foot is where the problem develops. So two factors actually explain heart attacks. One is the instability of the blood vessel wall of the coronary arteries because of vitamin deficiency. And the second one is the heartbeat. Well, obviously we can influence only one of these two factors. Because if we take away the heartbeat, we are dead anyway. Now we can suddenly also answer the second question. Why do we get arteriosclerosis and not venosclerosis? The blood pressure in the artery is 120, sometimes 160 millimeters Hg. In the vein, it depends. It is around zero, sometimes a little bit higher, sometimes a little bit lower. So there's a suction actually. So the blood pressure expands the blood vessel wall of the arteries. And under this pressure, the endothelial cells open a little bit, just enough to start this process slowly. Whereas in, whereas in the veins, the blood just cycles through. That's why we get arteriosclerosis and not venosclerosis, because of the blood pressure exposing the underlying instability of the artery wall. And of course, this question is solved too. Why do we die in epidemic proportions from heart attacks and strokes? And this disease is essentially unknown in the animal world. 
because animals produce their own vitamin C in relatively high amounts, increasing the stability of their artery walls and protecting them from developing these deposits. I will briefly touch on a few other heart disease related conditions because I know some of you came not because of atherosclerosis but of related health problems. Heart failure, the people with edema, shortness of breath. These are muscle cells of the heart. Each of these cells has little power plants inside called mitochondria. And the lack of energy in these power plants causes these cells to contract insufficiently. Instead of contracting like this and pumping the heart, they contract like this because there's too little bioenergy. The key molecules providing bioenergy to these power plants are vitamins and other micronutrients. Vitamin C, carnitine, coenzyme Q10, B vitamins, etc. Adding those micronutrients to the diet will provide energy to these cells and restore the normal function of these cells in pumping. This is an x-ray of a human heart. This is the normal size. Something is wrong here. It is enlarged because the muscle cells have this problem. They can no longer pump the blood out of the heart because they're too weak. So in 1931, a Dutch doctor working in Southeast Asia took those pictures. Christian Eichmann. And he had the idea that this disease can be repaired by giving B vitamins, particularly vitamin B1. And three weeks later, he took another x-ray from the same patient. And he got the Nobel Prize. Um, listen to this. He got the Nobel Prize for discovering that vitamins are the solution to heart failure in 1931, almost 90 years ago. If you come to a clinic in the Netherlands or to the German Heart Center or to uh, the Rockefeller University in New York today with heart failure, they will tell you your chances of being alive in five years are 50%. Unless we exchange your heart. Heart transplant operation is the current solution to this problem. Do you think that something is wrong here? Well, good. Um, then I'm not alone here. We studied this question. We, we looked not just in vitamin B, but also in composing a team of micronutrients. And we could show that on average we were able to bring patients that could no longer 
do their business, work at home or in their professions because of heart failure conditions, could go back to lead an almost normal life by a daily micronutrient composition. Again, we are looking at a watershed event in the history of medicine, a sudden understanding that the cause of one of the deadly diseases of our time, heart failure, is micronutrient deficiency leading to energy problems. It is like you forgetting to give your car gasoline and expecting it to drive. The solution of doctors since Christian Barnard exchange the motor. While the solution is to fill up the gas tank. We tested micronutrient compositions. Are they able to provide the energy for these power plants? Here you see muscle cells and here you see one of those power plants, the mitochondrium, where this ATP, which is the gasoline of the, our cells, is being uh, metabolized into energy. And we were testing micronutrient composition, and one of them increased ATP production by 45%. Again, these were the cells without micronutrient addition. Irregular heartbeat. A 10-year-old child knows that electricity has something to do with energy. Not so many doctors. I myself am a doctor, so I'm not accusing my colleagues. Actually, I'm taking them under my wings. We are in the same boat. We never, during our education, heard anything about the things you heard tonight. We'll come to the reason why that is. It's no coincidence. It is the influ influence of special interests into the universities that influence what is being taught there. We said electrical cells in the heart are responsible for the heartbeat. You're not sitting there and say, pump, pump, pump. Something happened automatically in your heart that keeps it pumping. These fascinating cells create electricity, conduct electricity to these millions of cells, and ultimately induce the muscle cells to contract. Every heartbeat uses up electricity, uses it up biological energy. If you don't re-supplement it, you run the risk of irregular heartbeat because the system runs dry. We've done a double-blind, placebo-controlled, multi-center study with 131 patients, all of them suffering from arrhythmia, irregular heartbeat. With the micronutrients that we tested, we could reduce the episodes in a significant way compared to those patients who got placebo. They had double the success. The conclusions from this study was micronutrients can 
the can reduce the episodes of irregular heartbeat and improve the life quality of patients with irregular heartbeat. This is even more important because currently there is no antiarrhythmic drug in the entire world that can achieve similar results. And this is no surprise because they ignore the root cause of this problem. Last example, diabetes type 2. Huge problem because in this case many organs can be affected. The brain, the eyes, feet, kidneys, the heart of course. And again, micronutrient deficiency, in this case, in the blood vessel wall and in the pancreas, where insulin is being produced, influence the situation so that not fat is being deposited in the blood vessel wall, but what? Sugar molecules. Why? <laughs> for the very same reason, repair. And of course, now that we understand that the cardiovascular problems in diabetes type 2 are caused by micronutrient deficiency, we can correct that. But first, let me explain the specifics of this disease in some more details, which is quite fascinating. The reason why we are having these problems all over the body in diabetes is because there is a molecular similarity between glucose and vitamin C. As you can see, both are, have six carbon atoms and have a similar structure. And there are pumps, biological pumps, in the cell wall. And they cannot differentiate between glucose and vitamin C. In a healthy patient, an equal amount of these molecules are being transported inside the cell. In a sugar situation, as you can see, the vitamin C molecules are replaced by sugar molecules and the cells are being overloaded with sugar molecules which eventually leads to the deposition inside the blood vessel wall. And of course, from this understanding you can immediately deduct that the way to repair this is by increasing the amount of these yellow molecules here in order to create a balance for these pumps. We did a pilot test in patients with a micronutrient composition that we tested and we showed that the blood sugar level over six months decreased by 23% without us changing the insulin levels. Just by, sorry, without us adding insulin or um, pharmaceutical uh, diabetic drug, just by a natural means. And this is particularly fascinating. These are human blood vessel wall cells and we wanted to know can we develop a micronutrient composition that is able to protect these cells from the damage of high sugar levels, just like in the diabetic patients. And as you can see we tested three compositions and the middle one reached 100 percent. In other words, this composition completely protected the cells from damage by high sugar levels. Imagine what that means for diabetic patients. A diabetic patient does not get sick from the high sugar level. That is such a measurement in the doctor's office for 
seeing how the metabolism is doing. The patient, the diabetic patient, gets sick because the cells in the artery walls are being damaged. So having a means to protect them is actually going to the root cause of preventing the complications in diabetic patients. This is just a list of colleagues that have evaluated similar studies on the role of vitamin C and micronutrients in diabetic patients. I won't go into details, maybe the last one. It showed that not just vitamin C but also polyphenol rich nutrition um, increased the survival rate of diabetes type 2 patients by 40 to 50 percent. Survival rate, they lived 40 to 50 percent longer. I understand that many of these things are rather complex and I had to go through it in a relatively short time. But after we end here you can get this book in the Tain Saal, which is just across this aisle here where we also have some coffee and tea, and study it. And go to the internet, check up the references, and make, form your own opinion. Don't believe me. Form your own judgment. So we have to address the question, why, if I am right, why are you not hearing that in the evening news on national TV? Why is this not being taught in the schools and in the uh, universities of the Netherlands, or for that matter any other country? This year, 2017. The breakthrough was already made and published a quarter of a century ago. How come? Did we, Linus Pauling and I, not say it clearly enough? Did we hide this information? Not really. The last public call of the two-time Nobel laureate, Linus Pauling, was a call for an international effort to abolish heart disease. I repeat, to abolish heart disease, which means to eliminate heart disease. It ends with a sentence the goal of eliminating heart disease as the major cause of death and disability is now in sight. That's Linus's handwriting. And here we are, 26, 27 years later, and still every year the population of the Netherlands is vanishing. The philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer said, every truth goes through three stages. First, it is being ridiculed, not taken serious. Secondly, it is being heavily fought by the status quo. And the third stage is that everyone says, well, we knew it all along. It is being generally accepted. So let's look at the question, who is the status quo? Who has an interest to fight? Well, this is the status quo. The pharmaceutical investment business. Their annual sales are one that is wrong, that is one billion dollars. Actually in the US 
it is one trillion. So it's one thousand milliard. One thousand milliard. It's a one with twelve zeros. That's their sales per year. It's one of the largest and most profitable investment industries on this planet. Surpassed, I believe, only by banking and the IT sector now. And here are the laws of the pharmaceutical business. No one goes out here and says, Dr. Rath was talking about a certain drug that doesn't work. Or he talked about a certain drug company that is bad. He didn't. Dr. Rath talks about the principle of having an investment business that thrives on the continuation of disease. That's what he talks about. Precisely, the pharmaceutical industry is not a health industry. Whoever thinks that has to think again. It is an investment business that is art has been artificially created. The driving force of this investment business is not the health of the people. It is the shareholder value of this investment business. The marketplace of this investment business is your body, but only if it is sick. The entire future, just like with any investment industry, they are dependent on growth. Otherwise, they vanish. So if your market is disease and you need to grow this market, what do you have to do? You have to make sure that diseases continue as markets and that new diseases are created as markets. That's what you have to do. By law, not because you are bad, but by, by the very law of this industry. And here comes the most disturbing fact. In order not to threaten the global disease market of pharmaceutical patented synthetic drugs, the merchandise of this industry covers symptoms and avoids to treat the root cause of disease. Again, it's just analytical thinking. And as a consequence of that, what you heard about tonight, prevention and elimination of diseases, that's the end of this industry. You take the market away. You give it in the hands of the people. It's not just Dr. Rath talking like that. There are people that speak a much more bold language. One of them I saw on national TV, in, on Radar, April 4, 2016. Peter Götze, a professor from Denmark. Well, you can see what he said, the pharmaceutical industry strongly resembles the Mafia, only that they kill many more people than the Mafia ever can. Again, not because they are bad individual people, because it is the business principle that they choose. And it does not make any difference if we say the head of Glaxo or the head of Roche needs to step down. Nothing will change because he will be replaced by someone who plays the same game. The only way to change this is through your mind. 
And through you, checking out what you heard tonight, whether this can be true. And if you come to the conclusion that this is right, then you need to act. We talked about the status quo. They were so afraid of the things that you heard tonight that over the last 15 years, actually between 1999 and 2010, they brought more than 120 lawsuits in courts on three continents against me, our research team. This is a picture from the shelf of our law firm. The binders put side by side from these lawsuits are 500 meters long, half a kilometer. That is how much afraid they were, or they are. No breakthrough in the history of medicine ever has triggered such a fierce attack from the status quo than the breakthroughs in micronutrient research, in vitamin research, in science-based natural health that you have heard about tonight. None. The goal of this amok run was obvious. They wanted to avoid that I can talk to you tonight. That this information spreads. And they did that for purely protectionist reasons. So that their business, the business, the investment business with disease can continue. And mankind has no possibility to rid itself from the epidemics that currently haunt them, heart disease, cancer in particular. That's why they did it. 25 years ago, when I took up the relay from Linus Pauling, who said, Matthias, you need to continue this battle. I was sitting down with Dr. Netzwicki and we said, if we do this, will we be alive when the change comes? And we were, we came again and again to the conclusion that it will be such a hard battle, such an overpowering imbalance of economic power against the largest at that time and, and most lucrative investment industry and here small a few small researchers at that time. So we have to answer tonight the question what brought the success of David against Goliath? Why am I here tonight? Why am I not in, in prison? Essentially, there are two factors. The first two will go together. First is we base everything on science. We could prove everything we said. These 120 lawsuits in the courtrooms, every single one of them was decided by science. If we would have represented aromatherapy or uh, other natural health approaches that cannot be proven, scientifically proven, this would have never happened. I wouldn't be here tonight. This whole thing would have been dead after three months. Now we are here after 25, 26 years. 
And that gives me the opportunity to say thank you to all these people in this room who have been with us for 10, some of them 20 years. Through all these attacks that happened in those times. So to, uh, thank you to the people on three continents that are supporting this. And to those of you who are here tonight for the first time, I'm saying we as scientists could bring this process to this point. The scientific evidence is overwhelming. Now it is up to you, the people, whether this becomes an irreversible process. No longer up to us. We will support you as scientists. But the success, whether your children and grandchildren die from preventable diseases, that depends on you. And through this process of attacks and attacks and attacks in the media, we got so much attention that this happened here. This is the number of publications on health benefits of vitamins on PubMed, the online library of the American US government, crossing 60,000 now. What is this year? 1990? Does this ring a bell? This was the year when these groundbreaking, these landmark publications came out on heart disease and on cancer in 1992. So this is the dialectic of this process. By attacking us, they, they actually, the status quo actually, is accelerating its own demise. This number of studies they could ignore. This number of studies they can't. The elimination of heart disease as an epidemic that haunts mankind is the next great goal uniting all mankind. And our long-term goal is the establishment of preventive health care, not just in heart disease, but in cancer and in other diseases too. Prevention is the precondition for elimination. Who would have thought 10 years ago that the French government and the Swedish government would ban diesel and gasoline cars from their streets? by 2020, 2030, in the foreseeable future. No one. But it's happening because the people want it. And this one, what you heard about tonight, is the next big change. The people of the world are taking back their right to prevent diseases, which has been taken for them under the influence of those economic interests that I just mentioned to you. So what, does I, what do I mean with building preventive health care? Well, first of all, we need to start information centers on natural preventive health in every town, in every city, in Utrecht, Amsterdam, every city. The people of the world, in their towns, where they live, 
must have the possibility to inform themselves, get the truth that the mass media are not giving them under the influence of the economic interests. Education in natural, especially science-based natural health and nutritional medicine have to be an element of education from kindergarten to adult education. We have to put pressure that the governments are no longer spending our taxpayer money for subsidies of the pharmaceutical business with disease, because that's what they do now. We have to put pressure on them that they use the taxpayer money to turn the healthcare system from repair to prevention. We have to create new professions, consulting professions in natural and preventive health, independent of the current education system in healthcare that is heavily influenced by the status quo. We have to spread the information that you just heard about, that micronutrients can do things that conventional medicine cannot. And the last one is particularly important. It is no longer acceptable that medical research is the privilege and the monopoly of those who make the business with ongoing diseases. It is no longer acceptable for intelligent people, and I hope that most of us are part of it. It is no longer possible that we tolerate that. Our taxpayer money has to be spent for establishing a national and international research institutions independent of pharmaceutical interests, they are excluded because any influence on, of them in such an institute would corrupt the goal. And the goal of this research has to be prevention. I gave a speech on preventive health care that outlines these principles in more detail that I can touch tonight. You can find this Baletta talk in, on the internet too. What can you do now? Inform yourself, read the books. Question what you heard about tonight but also question what you read in the mass media, what you hear on TV. Because the status quo, the pharmaceutical investment business, can only exist as long as you are being kept illiterate as it relates to health. Vaccinate yourself by trying to understand the principles of the investment business with disease. Speak with the people that you're going to meet over there in the train Saal, if you join us, that are part of our Health Alliance, have been part for a long time. Ask them questions. And if after all this, you come to the conclusion this is a cause that you want to commit to, then join our alliance. We just incorporated an association for that very purpose, 
to shift into the second gear as it relates to building preventive healthcare also in the Netherlands in an organized way. On your chairs you find a little postcard if you want to be informed about the progress of our research. Fill it out and drop it into one of those boxes at the exit and we will inform you about what is new so that you can participate in that way. We invite you to join us. I mentioned it before. It's just across the uh, place on this side of the church. This is my last slide. The right to prevent diseases and above all to eliminate them will not be given to you by anyone voluntarily. Remember the shelves of our law firm. It will not be given to you voluntarily or to us. We have to fight for it. We have to be active and say this is what we want. And this is why. It is only when we have the conviction and the courage to do so that we will achieve this goal. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Maybe I'll see you over there in the Tainzal. Thank you very much. <laughs>